I was under the impression that Mom had substantial savings. Didn't I mention it before? I've already asked her to leave. What's the point of harboring a jobless freeloader? I've been staying here for three months, and my son and his wife have drained my savings. They treated me like a maid. I had enough of it, so I left quietly. Just then, my son called me, Mom, what's going on? Tony sounded frantic on the phone. Around that time, something I did became headline news across the United States. I'm Sarah, 70 years old. I've lived in France for several years, but my health took a turn for the worse. So I returned to the States. My old apartment was gone. So I reached out to my son, Tony, and his wife, Alice, to see if I could stay with them for a while. Tony, my only son, is 44 and works in an office. He and his wife, Alice, don't have kids, and they seem to live quietly. We lost touch while I was away, but I decided to reconnect, and Tony seemed glad to hear from me. I explained my situation and asked if I could stay for a while. Tony reluctantly agreed. It was awkward to impose on them, but the joy of seeing my family again overcame my hesitations. With a mix of nervousness and happiness, I took a taxi from the airport to their house. When I arrived, Tony and Alice greeted me at the entrance. While Tony looked happy, Alice was visibly unhappy. I planned to stay here for a few months. My belongings would be delivered later. I dropped off my carry-on bag and went to the living room. We chatted about our daily lives, jobs, and my recent life in France. When Tony asked why I had moved to France, I simply said, I'm getting old and wanted to enjoy the French countryside. Tony laughed, but Alice remained unhappy. Then we discussed my health issues. I've been experiencing severe dizziness and was told it might be Meniere's disease. When a seizure occurs, people may be unable to stand because their surroundings are spinning and they may feel nauseous. I feel insecure living alone so I wanted to stay with them until my condition stabilizes. After a conversation, I went back to the entrance to grab my belongings from my carry-on. As I was organizing my stuff in the hallway, I'd overheard Tony and Alice's conversation. Tony, are you serious about letting Sarah stay? I don't want to live with an old woman, Alice said. Come on, she's my mom. You also work part-time, so it's not like you'll always be around, Tony replied. Yeah, but what about our days off? How long is she planning to stay? I want her gone, Alice complained. Don't talk like that. Mom will eventually leave. We can discuss finances tomorrow. Just keep it down. She might hear you, Tony cautioned. She can't hear us. She's old. Age brings sharp ears for insults, Alice remarked. And there I was, eavesdropping on their conversation in the cold hallway. I feel bad for imposing on Tony and his wife so suddenly. I'm sure it's a big inconvenience for them, but you know, I'm really happy to be spending time with Tony and his wife after all these years apart. When Tony was young, I raised him as a single mom after losing my husband. We didn't have much, and Tony had his share of hardships dealing with illness. All this isn't making up for that, but I wanted to come here to share my apologies and gratitude. That's why I came to this house. It's a shame. I wasn't exactly welcomed, but they had their own lives to lead. I retreated to the guest room they provided, trying to calm my anxious heart. The next morning, Tony left for work, leaving just Alice and me in the house. I was in the living room, engrossed in some crafting, when Alice approached me. Hey, Sarah, can you not make such a mess? She remarked, surveying the scattered fabric scraps and threads. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll clean it up, I replied, eager to rectify the situation. I showed her the small pouch I was sewing, adorned with a cute green turtle design. It's a turtle pouch. I love turtles, so I make little turtle-themed crafts. It even has a zipper on its shell, I explained. That's nice, Sarah, but you can't just hang around here all day, Alice interrupted, clearly disinterested. At least go somewhere else when I'm off from my part-time job. You're in the way. But I get dizzy if I go outside too much. I try to explain, but Alice cut me off. I'll drive you to the nearby community center to stay there during the day. I have things to do at home. Also, help with the chores while you're here. 
It's the least you can do since we're letting you stay. Don't do crafts. Do some cleaning and laundry, she instructed firmly, leaving no room for discussion. Stunned, I finally acquiesced. All right then, I said slowly as I got up. From then on, I ended up doing all the housework, despite feeling dizzy and sore. Alice and Tony treated me like a housekeeper. Moreover, Alice seemed addicted to social media, constantly glued to her phone. It appeared she hadn't been keeping up with the household chores before I arrived. That night, Mom, did you bring your banking card? Tony asked with a smile as he returned home. I don't mind you living with us, but life costs money. Could you chip in? I looked at Tony over my reading glasses, nodded, and stood up. Retrieving the banking card from my handmade pouch, I handed it to Tony. He checked it quickly, and his expression tightened. Wait, Mom, is this all you have saved? Any other accounts? Tony inquired, his tone becoming serious. That's all I have. I don't need much at my age. No chronic illnesses or anything, I replied smiling. But Tony persisted, asking if I had any more money. When I said no, he sighed and slumped his shoulders. Fine, I'll hang on to this cash for now. I'm doing you a favor letting you live here, so this is the least you could do, he said, his tone tinged with disappointment, after gaining access to my account password. That night, Tony seized my bank and debit cards, then left the room. Lying in bed, I could hear Tony muttering through the separating wall. Oh, this is a letdown. I totally thought mom was loaded. Our household is actually in the red. Shouldn't have said she could stay. See, I told you, kick her out already. That jobless moocher brings us no benefits whatsoever. Their voices carried with confidence, audible even through the walls. Perhaps they wanted me to overhear. In my cold bed, I fought back tears of loneliness and sorrow. The next day, since Alice had a day off, she drove me to the local community center. Planning to continue my handiwork, I opened my bag in the lounge area only to realize I had left the essential fabric at home. Though my dizziness was under control, I hesitated to ask Alice to retrieve it. Familiar with the area, I decided to walk home for the fabric. Upon my return, I glimpsed through the window into the house. To my surprise, Alice was with an unfamiliar man. They seemed intimately close. Unsure of how to proceed, I lingered outside before quietly retreating. It dawned on me why they wanted me out, to avoid interrupting their affair. Back at the community center, thoughts of Alice and the man consumed me. Seeking advice, I called someone. Despite the situation, I continued interacting with Tony and his wife, avoiding any mention of the man. However, whenever I left the house, I purposefully left a red turtle pouch on the living room side table. Three months had elapsed since I began staying with Tony's family. By then, I had essentially become the household maid. I tirelessly performed endless chores, and when Alice was home, I was relegated to the community center. My savings had dwindled, mostly drained by Tony's gambling addiction, a product of the financial hardships he endured as a child. Despite my attempts to intervene, mentioning it always incensed him. After enduring three months of turmoil, one night before a long weekend, I resolved to act on something I had been contemplating. Facing Tony and Alice, I expressed my gratitude for letting me stay, but I also knew. I realized now that my lack of financial stability made life harder for you when you were young. I'm truly sorry for all the trouble I've caused. Despite everything, I'm grateful for your kindness. With a heavy heart, I reached for a homemade turtle pouch from the table. It was green, with a zipper on the shell. This is a token of my gratitude to both of you. I hope you'll accept it. I said, hoping to mend the strained atmosphere. Contrary to my hopes, neither Tony nor Alice showed any interest in my handmade pouch. Mom, enough of that. Are we really out of money? Think about the French account or something, Tommy suggested, his tone growing more impatient. Tony, I told you we are out of money. Look, I worked really hard on this. Can you just take it as a token of my love? I pleaded, trying to evoke memories of happier times. But Tony's irritation only escalated. I'm not a kid anymore. 
I'm not happy receiving something like this, he retorted, while his wife gave me a cold look. Desperate to salvage the situation, I mentioned Joe, who had helped us in our old apartment. But Tony brushed it off, demanding that we stop dwelling on the past. Stunned into silence, I clenched the turtle pouch in my hand, feeling the texture of the paper inside. The next day, Tony and his wife left for vacation, leaving me behind. After our conversation, I had already planned to leave the house. Hastily, I packed my bags, arranging for them to be sent to my home in France. I made sure to include the red turtle pouch in my carry-on bag. Leaving a simple note of thanks and goodbye on the table, I departed from the house where I had stayed for three months. Instead of returning home immediately, I stayed in a U.S. hotel for a while. I had things to sort out, and I expected Tony and his wife to reach out to me eventually. True to my expectations, about two weeks later, Tony called. Mom, what's going on with the turtle pouch? It's yours, isn't it? He asked, his voice filled with curiosity and confusion. I wasn't surprised when I saw the news on TV about the turtle-shaped pouch I had intended to give to Tony and his wife. Inside it was a check for $1 million, a way of saying thanks for all they'd done and apologizing for the trouble I caused as a kid. Some might find it shallow to atone with money. But for over 40 years, I had dreamed of the day I could give it to them, saving up bit by bit. Before reuniting with Tony after a long time, I did some research and discovered he was drowning in debt. He had attempted to settle his gambling debts with more gambling, only to sink deeper. Despite holding a steady job, I simply wanted him to clear his debts and find peace. However, they refused my gesture, seemingly forgetting the kindness they once showed to my family and me. In response, I divided the million-dollar check into smaller sums and anonymously donated them to various charities and welfare organizations across America. Each donation was placed in the handmade turtle pouch, which soon became a sensation, making headlines and trending on social media. As the news spread, Alice came across the story online. Isn't that the turtle pouch, Mom? Wait, were you going to give us one filled with money too? She asked. I explained that it was indeed my way of expressing gratitude and apologizing. However, Tony exploded with anger over the phone, refusing to accept the gesture, accusing me of deception, and demanding the money back. Unable to bear his outburst, I intervened, offering the last red turtle in an envelope for him to collect. We agreed to meet at a cafe later that day. When I arrived, Tony and his wife were already there, demanding the money before I even sat down. Silently, I presented the red turtle. Tony snatched it eagerly, only to find a small electronic device inside. Confused, he pressed a button, triggering a voice recording. Alice's voice filled the air, speaking warmly with another man, a voice that wasn't Tony's. Shock washed over Tony and Alice as they realized it was a recording of her affair at home. In the chaos that ensued, I laid out several incriminating photos on the table, snapshots of Alice with her secret lover. Confronted with irrefutable evidence, Alice tried to deny and deflect, but Tony examined each photo closely. Feeling betrayed, Tony questioned why I resorted to such measures. I explained that a friend suggested hiring someone to investigate, and I felt compelled to uncover the truth. Despite the turmoil, I hoped they would eventually understand the gravity of their deceit within the family dynamic. Fate seemed to guide me towards the discovery of Tony's infidelity. As the accusations flew between Tony and Alice, revelations poured forth, exposing their hidden secrets. Tony was grappling with a substantial debt accumulated from gambling, while Alice, in an affair, had been channeling her earnings to her partner. Their financial struggles were laid bare as I disclosed the results of a thorough investigation into their finances. Both were on the verge of bankruptcy, desperately seeking a way out. They insisted that I provide the money I had donated to charities. But I had already depleted my savings and left them with only a red turtle figurine. The situation escalated into a chaotic scene at a cafe, with Tony aggressively demanding the million-dollar donation. Police intervention became necessary to restrain him, leading to a strained relationship between us. 
In the aftermath, Tony's life spiraled further into gambling and debt, culminating in job loss and isolation. As for Alice, the fallout from her affair, combined with financial struggles, led to her divorce from Tony. She faced harassment, lost her part-time job, and her affair partner abandoned her. Left with no income, she relied on temporary assistance for needy families. Returning to my home in France, I resumed my life and work. In my apartment, Joe, a cohabitant and dear friend, greeted me. Joe, who had been a lifeline during our days of poverty, now shared a happy life with me. He had founded a support program for the needy, and we have been working together for years. While unpacking souvenirs from my trip to America, I reflected on my past and the path I had chosen. The organization we built together had grown into an international entity, focusing on supporting single moms. Despite the challenges with Tony and Alice, I found fulfillment in the work we were doing. At 70 years old, I embraced the opportunities ahead, determined to make a positive impact. With a smile, Joe and I continued our work, planning to expand our activities in America. Despite the complexities of family relationships, I cherished the brief moments of happiness spent together. As I prepared for an international speech, I affirmed that at 70, there was still much to achieve and contribute to the world.